I'm Jancy to Spain with Bright Idea Tutoring. This is the second video in my series on the Clayson rearrangement. In this video, I'm going to show you how to predict products, but I want you to be aware this method doesn't always work for more complicated molecules. A lot of tutors want to tell you it's not good to just learn how to predict products. You really have to learn how to do the full mechanism. And I'm not usually that kind of tutor. I'm all about teaching you a quick and easy way to do the prediction of products so that when you see a question on your test that just says predict the product, you want to be able to do it in just a couple of seconds without thinking your way through the mechanism. But I promise for the Clayson rearrangement, it's really difficult to do an accurate prediction of products without doing the full mechanism unless you have the most simple type of reactant. So I do want to show you how to do prediction of products, but just please be aware that this is only going to work for the most simple allele phenyl ether. And I'm also going to show you how to do one for an allele vinyl ether. So when you do have a very straightforward allele phenyl ether like this, see how we only have an allele group, there's no extra substituents, and we only have a phenyl group, no extra substituents. These steps are going to work for us. The first thing that we always want to do, whether we're predicting products or whether we're doing the mechanism, is set this reactant up in a way that's going to look the same for us every time and make it really easy to work with. So we want to put the allele group at the top and kind of stretched over to the right. And then we want to put our phenyl group down at the bottom. And it's always a good idea when we're putting in our double bonds to put the first double bond in here at the top right so that it can interact with this double bond because those two are going to be reacting with each other. Now that we've drawn this molecule, we're going to start the process of predicting product. First thing we're going to do is break the bond between the O and our allele group. And really that just means erasing this bond. Now I'm going to go ahead and mark this carbon. That's like the broken end of our allele group. I'm going to add an H to my O to make this into phenol. Then I'm going to connect this broken end of my allele group to carbon 2 of my phenol. It's actually going to look like this. And it's important to notice that this double bond isn't conjugated with the rest of the benzene ring. That's always going to be true. Now this is a true and accurate final product for this. But be aware that the more bonds I add over here or here, this isn't going to be an accurate representation of what our final product is going to look like. So here's what you do know. When you have an allele phenyl ether, you're going to have a final product that contains phenol and attached to carbon 2 of phenol, there's going to be an allele group, meaning carbon-carbon double bond with an sp3 carbon in between. But anything else could be attached. There could be stuff here or here. You just don't know. So know that when you do a Clayson rearrangement on an allele phenyl ether, you're going to be working towards phenol with a substituent off carbon 2, and there will be a carbon-carbon double bond at the allele position. Now let's look at how to handle an allele vinyl ether. And I've just changed the steps a little bit because we're dealing with a vinyl group instead of a phenyl group, and there is one extra step at the end. And again, please, please believe me, these steps only work to predict accurate products if we have the most simple form. This is just a vinyl group, no extra substituents, and just an allele group, no extra substituents. First, I want to set this up so that my allele group is on top and bending over to the right. And when I draw my vinyl group on the bottom, I also want it to go over to the right. This is kind of similar to when we drew the benzene ring and we had this double bond here over to the right so that this double bond could react with this double bond. Now what I'm going to do is first break the bond between my allele group and my O. And I'm going to mark this as sort of like the broken end of my allele group. I'm going to protonate this O. And notice how I formed an enol. Then I'm going to connect this broken end of my allele group to this far end of the enol. 
So I'm going to take this and bond it right here. And just like what we saw on the benzene ring, these two double bonds are not conjugated with each other. When most people draw this molecule, they draw them conjugated because you're used to drawing conjugated double bonds. And you've got to know that if you draw it conjugated, it's wrong. So make sure that you draw non-conjugated double bonds with an sp3 in the middle. Then you'll want to notice this is still an enol. The enols are unstable. They spontaneously tautomerize back into their ketone or aldehyde. So your last step is to convert this back into its carbonyl. And this is our final product. Now, if this end of our ether or this end of our ether had had any extra substituents, there may be extra substituents anywhere on this molecule, and I promise you cannot predict where they're going to be unless you go through the mechanism. Please learn how to do the mechanism. But your basic structure will have a carbonyl with two sp3 carbons before a carbon-carbon double bond. That will be your basic internal structure, and it will have other substituents off of it. So if you know that this is the kind of structure that you're looking for, that may help you check whether your final product is right after doing the mechanism. So now let's actually learn how to do the mechanism, because for this reaction, it is vital.